Okay. Okay, so we are recording, and we'll get started. <laughs> so, uh, hello everyone. My name is Double Tap, also known as Matt Parker. Um, I, I currently and have been running the PCT Water Report for the last five years, and also manage a Facebook page on on the passes, creek crossings, water and fire uh, updates on the PCT, which I'll talk a little bit more about during this webinar. So, uh, Ned, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, obviously, my name is Ned Tibbetts, and uh, I hiked the PCT in 1974 and began a wilderness school in 1982 called Mountain Education to uh, to help you guys um, be safe out there. So, uh, Matt has been kind enough to uh, create this uh, event tonight, so I hope you've got lots of questions, and I can uh, give you 37 years of uh of, of answers. <laughs> yeah, Ned's very knowledgeable. I uh, ran his own company for many years, giving uh, snow, snow uh, travel and experience and, and training classes on that. Um, for myself, I, I through hiked the PCT in 2014, and uh, that's actually where I met Half Mile, and Half Mile was running the, the water report at the time, and uh, since then I've been helping him out and pretty much been doing it full time for the last uh, three, four years. So we're going to jump right into this. Um, I don't hear I don't hear a lot of background noise, which is good. Usually that's a problem, so I may ask you to mute your mics if I hear a lot of background noise. And I apologize if you can't see what I'm presenting, but I, I am recording this and we'll be uploading it to the PCT Water YouTube channel, where I always post the webinars afterwards. And also on the PCTWater.com website, I'll have the slides here with all the hyperlinks, so you can download that and just click on it. It'll take you to all this information that I'm going to be talking about. But um, before we, we get into just the general q and I wanted to go over um, some, some highlights and also some, some information, you know, some crowd sharing resources that are free that you may not know about. Um, but what's the main goal of this, of this webinar? Well, the main goal is to, to educate people to, so that you're making safe and smart decisions. Um, unfortunately, two years ago on the PCT 2017, which was a, a very similar snow year, we had two fatalities. Uh, there were two separate drownings and we'll talk about where that where that happened on the creeks. Now we're not here to try and scare you away. We're just here to educate you on on what to do to avoid those kinds of situations and to minimize you know, the danger aspect of it. Um, but a few a few comments before I jump into some of the details. Um, if you're if you're in say like Kennedy Meadows right now, which I think Ryan says he's at, um, some things that some very high level uh, tips or advices, if you will. Um, make sure you go into the Sierra as a group right now. Um, you know, if, if this was two or three months later, you could go and buy yourself no problem. Uh, myself, I go backpacking in the Sierra solo all the time. I go off trail a lot now on the Sierra higher route. Um, but for myself, I would not go into the Sierra right now unless I had at least one other person with me, ideally a few other people. And that's primarily to, um, you know, to help out with the Sierra passes and for the creek crossings. And, and more importantly, make sure that someone in your group has an in-reach device, so some kind of two-way messaging satellite device, um, because we, we've already had one person go missing this year in the Sierras earlier. It was a gentleman who was trying to through hike the Sierra High Road, actually, in, in the early winter months. But it's really important that at least one person in your group has this device in case someone really gets into danger. Um, I'm hearing some background noise. Um, would you guys mind muting your mics so, so we can... Thank you. Okay, that's better. <clears throat> And I, I see this a lot where groups go into the Sierra and they don't have some kind of two-way messaging device. You know, they disappear, people can't be found, and then they have to send search and rescue crews in there to find them, and that puts their lives at risk. So I think that's a really important point for everyone to realize. Um, I'm, I'm still hearing some background noise. Could you, would you guys mind muting your microphones, please? Okay, I'm still here. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Thank you for muting. Appreciate it. Um, and also, the Sierra right now, it's, it's not for everyone. Um, whether you go in right now is, is, a, is a really personal decision. Um, you, you're going to see a lot of people on Facebook and Twitter saying, oh, you're stupid for going in right now, or you're stupid for not going in right now. There is no right answer. It all depends on your skill set and what your limitations are. And we're going to talk a little bit about that during this webinar. Um, and just to also, for the ones who can't actually see this uh, when I'm presenting and when you're actually recording, watching the recording later, I've recently got some really good photos and videos from two guys, uh, Justin McCormick and Jeff Taylor, so I like to just give credit to them because they're sending in some really good photos of the passes. For example, right now I'm showing 
um, from June 3rd, you know, just five days ago on the south side of Mather Pass, what it looks like. And we're going to talk about why that's important. And by the way, this is a real free, free flowing, you know, open webinar. Feel free to ask questions at any time. And um, like I said earlier, you can type in your, your, your questions on the left side of the Skype box and I'll try to address those as we go along. So uh, a, lo a lot of things in the agenda, but don't worry, I'm not going to spend too much time on them because I want to reserve the, the most, of, most of this to be Q&A for you guys out there in the field right now. Um, but I, I mentioned the PCT Water YouTube channel, and if you can actually see what I'm presenting right now, I'm clicking on that link. And this will be in the PowerPoint slides that you can download from pctwater.com. Um, I'll upload them tonight after, after I get the recording done. This is the channel where all of our webinars are, are located. It's, it's all free, so feel free to go through. I, I do a webinar every year for um, the Water Report, just kind of explaining how it works. I'm sure most, if not all of you, are using the Water Report and Gut Hooks. Um, if not, I highly recommend you use both because it's more information at your fingertips. And on this page, you'll see there's, um, there are actually two Sierra 2017 webinars that Ned and I did. Um, both of them are good. Um, I tend to go towards the one that had the seven and a half thousand views, but that's a real good primer. And hopefully you had a chance to, to watch that today before you got on this webinar, because we're not going to go through everything we went through on that one. We spent a lot of time talking about, you know, past strategies, what the passes look like, um, gear and all that stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about gear today, too. But it's just a really good primer that has a lot of good information that's still very applicable to this year because the snow, the snow uh, levels were very similar. And then um, I did also a uh, 2019 PCT Water Report webinar. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but you can watch that at your own leisure. But one of the things that I really wanted to talk about today was um, the, uh, the water website. So uh, we should probably change the title. It's not just about water. It's also now about snow, creek crossings, fire updates. And for, for, for you hikers out there who are familiar with the website, this is what it looks like. And there's uh, six links for the water reports. Well, the link for the, snow, the Sierra Snow and Floor Report is right below it. So I'm going to click on that right now. And basically, it'll pull up a PDF. And it's set up just like the water report pages. And, and it's, it's very similar. You know, I get updates from you guys out there on the trail. Um, for example, I just got a lot of really good updates yesterday from a guy named All In. And he was given updates on uh, the Wallace Creek Ford, the Wright Creek Ford. These are some of the um, some of the the more dangerous creek crossings you, you'll run into uh, very early in your Sierra trip, right before you you hit Forester Pass. So this is a free crowd sharing source. Um, you know, if you send me photos or videos, I upload it to the Facebook page, which I'll show you here in a second. But I don't think a lot of the hikers realize this page is here. We created it in 2017 after we had the real high snow year. And what, what we're trying to do is give you a one-stop shop for all of this information. Um, I'm, here, I'm hearing some more background noise. Would you guys mind muting your mic microphones, please? Okay, thank you. So, you know, it's a really good idea to, to pay it forward, if you will, for the hikers behind you. Um, so, you know, once you get in the cell phone coverage range, you can come down here or you, 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 you can look to see what, what the updates are like for what you're about to hit, and then you can send in the updates to me via the water report or on the Facebook page. And like, for example, here, uh, Justin McCormick, who's been sending in a lot of great updates um, and, and some videos too, which I'll show you on the Facebook page. You know, he's talking about the Mono Creek crossing here June 6th, just two days ago, and he uploaded some videos, and he's saying this is a very challenging crossing right now, and it's going to become even more challenging in the next few weeks as the thaw progresses. So this is another resource for you. Um, I, when you go down, you know, I also added uh, roadways conditions and um, good news the the only road that's closed the only major road that's closed in the sierras right now is highway 120 through yosemite which is in tuolumne meadows which is not a surprise given the snow year we've had and i haven't seen any uh, forecast as to when that might open but it, it may be into july but all of the other roads are open sonora pass ebbets pass carson pass highway 50 interstate 80 those are all open as of today so that's good news so when you think of the water report, you know, think of it also as snow, you know, Sierra passes, 
creek crossings, and we also put fire detour information on there. We already have a few of them from last year on there, although we're not really in fire season yet. You'll see that popping up more in the uh, August and September time frame. Okay, so that's that. And then um, late, you'll, you, when I upload this recording and the slides, they'll be in the upper right-hand corner at the pctwater.com website. So that's that. Then um, the other thing I wanted to show you was this uh, Facebook page that we created a few a few years ago. So it's just called PCT Water Fire Passes Fords Update Group. Um, now, uh, you know, Facebook is great, but it has it has some, some weaknesses, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, you know, it has a typical wall, like, for example, you know, I was posting about this webinar here, but Justin McCormick, he posted some videos here. And I'm able to download these videos, save them. And what I do is I put them in these photo albums. And it's not really apparent right off the bat on how to find them. But if you come down to the left-hand side and you click on photos, and I'm, I apologize if you can't see this right now, but you can watch it later and see it, and click on albums, it'll pull up all the albums. And I've broken them up into sections, you know, the sections that are on half miles maps, basically. And this everything, everything I'm talking about here and everything on this page is referenced to half mile mileage points from a northbound perspective. Um, so you can see here, you know, CA sections, uh, California sections A through H so far, I've gotten photos and videos on. I left the um, uh, California section H up from last year on there too, just kind of as a reference. But, and then I think I also have, yeah, 2017 there too, in case you want to see some of those, but you know, they're not going to be current. But for example, the way this works is if you click on California section H, which is, you know, where the Sierras are at, You'll see all the photos and videos that have been uploaded to me and I try to put these in an order that makes sense. It's basically sorted by half mile mileage point and you can't see it in this view, but if you, if you click on edit, I don't know if you guys can see this because I'm actually the one who does it, but if you can't, it'll pull up a, a caption underneath and once you click on the video. So it'll say here, here's mile 778 Forrester Pass sent in on June 2nd by Jeff Taylor and then you know, one of the more infamous photos here. Let's see, I'll just save this and show it. Like here's here's the approach to Forrester Pass back on, this was May 13th, so it's a little out of date, but I I just got some updates from, um, I think it was Justin uh, McCormick for more recent crossings of Forrester Pass. And as you go down here, you're progressing through the Sierras. Um, there's even some alternate maps here for um, alternate crossings of some of the more dangerous creeks that was uploaded a couple days ago. And then down here at the bottom, um, uh, who was, I think it was Justin, he just sent in a bunch of really good videos of creek crossings. Uh, for example, let me see, this is uh, Bear Creek. So that was uh, one, one of the guys crossing Bear Creek as of June 5th, which, you know, which is only uh, three days ago. And Bear Creek is one of the more notoriously dangerous crossings. So, so the idea here is we're, we're trying to compile all this information and put it in one source so that when you do have cell coverage, you can, you know, somehow look at it, download it, digest the information, you know, decide, hey, do I need to get new gear? Or maybe decide, hey, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I want to, you know, skip further north and, and come back to the Sierras when, when, it, when the thaw is not happening, there's not as much snow. And like I was saying earlier, it's, it's, it's a really personal decision that you're making there. Okay. So um, it, it's really important too that, you know, you pay it for it for the hikers behind you. I'm going to harp on that a little bit because, you know, it, it's, you're building up good karma, right? But um, one of the challenges that I have is that I'm seeing a lot of people posting great updates on Sierra High Route Pass. I'm sorry, uh, Sierra Passes. Uh, creek crossings on any of the many <laughs> or any of the multiple PCT class of 2019 Facebook pages. I've counted four, I think, so far. And that's great and all. But the problem is, is um, I can't go searching all these pages and gather all that information. I mean, I, I try, I, I go every now and again and I try to, you know, look through the wall and see if there's anything that, that's interesting to, to put on our page. But if you post it to this PCT water fire passes and update group, then it, that will ensure that I will get it and I will put it into the right photo album so that other people can see it. And, I'll, and I always give credit to whoever put it up there. So make sure you, you tell me who it's from, you know, your name, your trail name, um, if, if you're emailing it to me or, or texting it to me. If it's on Facebook, I can see who sent it. But, you know, another thing that's important about this is that all, all these resources are free. We, we don't charge a dime for any of these. So, okay. Um, 
Any questions so far? Let's see. Uh, let's let me some questions. URL for website on water report. So that is pctwater.com. So um, so we'll go we'll go back to it. It's right here, pctwater.com. So this this is the general web website for all the water updates that you guys have been getting. You know, in, in the in the Southern California section. We even added Northern California, um, Oregon and Washington a few years ago. Um, Northern California was, was actually needed, in my opinion. Oregon and Washington, maybe not so much, but we kept it on there because people said, hey, why not? So, you know, go ahead and send us updates if you're in Oregon and Washington. Okay, let's go back. Let's see, let's see, album organization. I didn't realize you had all the photographic video reports organized like that. Yeah, so Nick, I appreciate you saying that because that was, that was one of the Hello? Pages. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> uh, Nick, I appreciate you saying that because that was one of the reasons for doing this webinar because I was seeing so many people up, you know, uploading great updates, but it was in 50 different media channels. And I'm really trying to conglomerate that to only come through one channel, you know, ultimately so I can compile it for you and give you guys the one stop shop for all the information. Because a photo or a video is worth, you know, a thousand words as opposed to a, a verbal description of what a, a high pass or a creek crossing is like. Okay, so uh, moving on here, let's go back into presentation mode. Um, talk a little bit about creek crossings. So the PCTA actually made, had a, they submitted a really good article here about crossing streams safely, and it's in the PowerPoint link I just, I just clicked on. Um, if you go to the PCTA website, which is www.pcta.org, and you click on Discover the Trail, you kind of have to go through a list here of backcountry basics and then water issues. But if you download the PowerPoint later, the link is it's already there. You just click on it. Then stream crossing. There's a really good article here that just has a lot of good information about, you know, how to cross these things safely, because this is probably the most dangerous aspect in my in my humble opinion um, of hiking the Sierra right now, especially now that the well, Ned, you may disagree with this. The thaw has, has the thaw officially started, Ned, or is it still to come? Um, the thaw is defined, the start of it is defined as when the nighttime temperatures rise above and stay above freezing. And according to NOAA at 11,000 feet, or the forecast for 11,000 feet, that should be occurring, um, I think it's going to be Monday or Tuesday. And so um, what you're seeing is, is high creek volumes uh, because of the low or the warm temperatures below that. But I'm primarily concerned with you know, trail elevation, and that is just beginning to climb above um, freezing now. So how long do you think this will last? That, that may be a tough question to ask, but given the <laughs> your experience and the snow levels. <laughs> um, okay, that's not a, a, a new question, so certainly that's an easy answer. Um, with the 200% of normal uh, volume of snow up there, um, I'm telling most people uh, four to six weeks of of some pretty crazy uh, water everywhere, um, you know, um, nasty creek crossings and all that sort of stuff. And then it'll probably come uh, mid-July sort of back to uh, what people are used to hiking in when they think of summer hiking in the Sierra, you know, with just snow on the passes and that'll be just patches and stuff. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, the slide that I'm showing right now, um, the photo is actually from two years ago. It's about the same time, so very similar, you know, winters and similar timing. But you can see this is Tyndall Creek, which is um, right before you get to Forester Pass, and there's a there's still a little bit of a snow bridge left for this uh, poor hiker to get across. And you can see this this water is raging, so you know you, you don't want you don't want to fall in one of these things because the odds of you surviving it are are, are quite slim. And unfortunately, in 2017, like I mentioned earlier, we had two hikers at two separate incidences, and I've highlighted them here in red. Um, this is unfortunately where they drowned, and um, they were by themselves. And you know, of course, no one knows what happened, but they did find their bodies about you know half mile down creek, and you know they had drowned. So be very wary of of, of actually all of these that I've listed here, but the ones in red are the ones that that are unfortunately potentially lethal. Um, I did just get uh, one of the maps that I showed you earlier, which is in the, the Facebook page, California Section H photo album, has an alternate crossing map for the South Fork of the Kings River. Um, and, and what's really nice about that map, it, it highlights one of the things down here that, I, that I've stated is you don't have to cross where the PCT is. I mean, hell, you may not, even, right. know, <laughs> you may not even know you're on the PCT because it's covered in snow. 
But I think a, a lot of people think, oh, I have to cross right here, especially if you see um, the trail on the other side. Um, a lot of times in the South Fork of the Kings River is a good example. Uh, Bear Creek at mile 869, which is the video I showed earlier, which is probably the most notorious dangerous crossing. Um, a I get a lot of updates saying, hey, I just went upstream. You know, sometimes it could be up to a mile, sometimes even more. Um, but, you know, it makes sense because if you're going upstream, there's less water coming in at that point. And ideally, the water won't be, you know, as raging, it won't be as deep, and it could be safer to cross. So always consider going upstream more. And this is obviously going to, you know, impact your timing. You're not going to be pulling 20, 25 mile days in the Sierra, especially this time of year with the snow. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible. Um, but a few other uh, points to mention here. Um, like I mentioned earlier, these are not the only dangerous crossings. There are many, many, many others. I'm just, it'd be too many to put in one page. I just wanted to highlight the ones that you really have to concentrate on. Um, crossing early in the morning can mean a big difference. Um, sometimes up to a few feet in the water level compared to crossing in late afternoon. And, and when I first heard this years, years ago, I thought, no, this is, this is not true. But I've, I've actually, I've seen it firsthand when uh, I was on a camping trip in Yosemite. And it can literally mean the difference of a few feet of water. So try and cross early in the morning if possible, which poses a different logistical challenge because later we're going to tell you to, to get over the passes as early as possible in the day. And usually the crossings are in between two passes at the lowest point. So these are all things you have to consider when you're making your, your Sierra Pass strategy. Okay. Um, Ned, I don't know if you, do you want to talk about creek crossing methods or do you have any references? I just want to make sure we we're inundating people with that kind of information if it's available. Um, what I wanted to do is to jump in. I, I didn't want to cut you off like I, I classically have. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to jump in and say about that South Fork of the Kings where the two girls were, uh, where they died. Um, people do not need to cross that thing at all. So if you uh, come upon it in, you know, from the south, you're, you're going northbound, uh, you see that it's just nothing but foaming water and it looks crazy, you know, follow the, follow it on the right, you know, turn right and follow the banks or whatever, you know, have it in sight. And just walk around it all the way up to Mather. You don't even have to cross the thing. So just because the summer trail goes somewhere, you don't have to uh, follow the summer trail if you know where it's going. Just, just keep it in sight or whatever. And, and by following the South Fork of the Kings on the east side of it, instead of crossing over to the west side. Um, the trail's on the west side. You can see it across the river. No big deal. Of course, it's buried in snow, so you technically can't see it, but you know where it is. Just follow it on up to, to the pass, and you're good. And you don't have to worry about that sort of a deadly crossing right there. Yeah, so what, what I'm doing then, I'm pulling up the half-mile maps for that, that crossing so I can kind of yeah. show it. It's a, it's a really good point, and because um, if you go to the right, or east, if you're northbound, or that takes you. So if, yep. you can, if you can see my screen right now, uh, WA0811. This is this is the South Fork of the Kings River, and and so this is where one of the hikers perished two years ago. And if you go up to the you know northeast here, you're just going further upstream. This there is a trail that'll take you up to Taboose Pass. You may not be able to see it with snow on right now, but if you go up further. You can cross over and then stay on the right side of, of um, the river on this side and find a better spot to cross. Where, unfortunately, where the trail crosses, it's it's there's actually like three or four different you know raging creeks that you have to get across. It's not just one; it's like a confluence of many creeks at once, which makes it even more dangerous. But I, I've actually hiked this section down from Taboose Pass, and it's a little steep, but it's not bad, and it's definitely going to be safer at this time of year than trying to cross right there. So. But this, you know, this is just one of many creek crossings you're going to have to navigate um, if you go into the Sierra right now or even in a, in a month or so, given the snow level. Yep. So, um, yeah, so so that's, you know, we could spend a lo really long time on this. And if you have any questions, you know, please let us know. Um, let me see if there's any questions. No, nope, don't see any right there. Okay. Um, you know, and want to spend a little bit of time talking about potential exit points. You know, let's say you go in and decide, wow, this is, I'm, I'm way over my head. I need to get out as fast as possible. And you don't want to, you don't want to go backwards because maybe you went over a pass or you crossed a creek that was a little too sketchy and you don't want to do that again. Well, the good news is that the PCT is actually pretty close to Highway 395 the entire time. You just can't see it. Um, this map shows the dotted line, the PCT on the eastern side of the Sierra's. 
And then 395, the Owens River Valley, these are all the trail towns that you're sending your, your boxes to, or, you know, you take it a zero and you got Lone Pine Independence, Big Pine, Bishop further up north. That's the good news. Um, and all you got to do <laughs> to make it some, sound simplistic and easy is get up over these passes on on the, the basically the high ridge of the Sierra is to get down to 395 where you can hitch. Now, there are passes, um, Baxter Pass, Sawmill Pass, you know, all your maps will have this information on it. Half Miles Maps has it on it. Um, the only problem is that they're going to be a little higher than the PCT and there's going to be a ton of snow and ice on it. So, you know, as opposed to maybe going over five more passes before you get to VBR or Mammoth, you only got one pass to get up and over. But these are bailout points. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, here's a list of all of the, the major passes between Kennedy Meadows and Interstate 8. Basically, this is the heart of the Sierras. And you can see, you know, some of them are pretty high elevations. Trail crest, if you decide to go up to Whitney at 13.6 K feet. Um, so every day you're going to be going over a pass, sometimes two if you're really in shape, although I, I try to only go over one pass a day, but you're probably in better shape than I am. Um, so just kind of a summary here to talk about it. But one of the things that, that you can do, and for, for the gentleman who's, on, who's at Kennedy Meadows right now, you actually are at the first potential exit point that I'm showing here um, in Section G. So Kennedy Meadows, that's a good place to take a break and go, okay, get all my information, get all of your snow gear that you, you ship to the store. Do I want to proceed forward from that point? Like I said earlier, that's really a personal decision up to you. If you decide to proceed further north, your first exit point is going to be, so Kennedy Meadows is about mile 702. Your first exit point is going to be about mile 744.5, so about 40, 42 miles later. And this is at a place called Horseshoe Meadow. Um, now, you're going to run into snow before you get here, especially from the reports I've been getting so far. And this is where the snow report page starts for the Sierra, basically around Mulkey Pass area. But from Mulkey Pass or Trail Pass and further over to the left here, you can't see it, but it's on the next page, Cottonwood Pass, all of these will get you down to Horseshoe Meadow. And from here, it's actually a, a really big campsite, although I think it's still closed right now because of snow. But from here, you can hike a half mile to where the gates are closed, at least as of a week and a half ago, they're closed, and ideally hitch a ride down to Lone Pine. Now, it's it's a really long road walk down there, but I've gotten reports that there are a lot. I wouldn't want to do it. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't want to do it either. But I've gotten reports that while cars can't come into the campground, there's a lot of day hikers who are parking right at the gate, which is only a half mile from the campground. So your odds are pretty good. That, that, you know, if you can get down to Horseshoe Meadows and hike out to where the gate is, that when those hikers come back from their, their day hikes, that you could, you know, hopefully catch a ride down the Lone Pine. So this is your first exit point. And then there's Cotton Cottonwood Pass right here is just the next page over. So there's three potential areas here. Once you go past Cottonwood Pass, you, you're, you're kind of committed um, for a while. Look at your maps and make sure you understand them. Hey, Matt. Sure, go for it. Hey, uh... Let me, let me add one thing there. Uh, you're committed after Cottonwood. Um, you don't have the option yet of Trail, um, trail Crest. Uh, that whole Whitney affair is still really steep, really crusty snow up there. It's much higher, so it's going to be colder than, than trail elevation. So don't count on uh, being able to zip over Trail Crest and down to Whitney Portal and, and get out. That's, that's not an option. Um, separate path which is the next one north uh, from the Tyndall Crossing. I tried going out that once during a windstorm, and it was just nothing but ice, and it's steep. So forget that one right at the moment. Unless the snow becomes real soft, it is going to get warmer. Um, but even then, that's pretty sketchy. So really, it's, it's Kearsarge and Cottonwood after Kennedy Meadows. Yeah, and what we did in the 2017 webinar is we actually went through all those exit points in, in pretty good detail. Um, I, I have the slides in this presentation. There's two of them. Called, we call them pass strategies, one per day. And we highlight them. Like, for example, a Kearsarge Pass, which is actually a pass most people go out anyways because that's a that's a logical stopping point you know, after, after you get your resupply in Kennedy Meadows. Um, you've been over Forester and uh, you, you're ready to, you know, get a bed and a hot shower and get your resupply box. But then the next exit point listed here is Baxter Pass uh, and then Sawmill Pass, then Taboose Pass. So we went through all these in very fine detail in the 2017 um, PCT Sierra webinar. 
which is on the YouTube PCT water channel. So make sure you watch that and just so you understand what your, your exit bailout points are. Let's see. Um, let me inject another sure. little point. Um, the minor passes like Baxter, Sawmill, Taboos, et cetera, their trailheads are sometimes at the end of dirt roads and infrequently uh, used. So if you've got a bale that way, you may get to the trailhead and not find a car, and then you're going to do a little road walk, and at least it'll be dirt road until you get out to some asphalt somewhere. So just food for thought. Yeah, good point. So um, one one of the things that we, we also put on the the water report snow page, for example, like um, I'm showing you, if you can see this, page six on California Section H, this is after Glen Pass, and you come down here to a mileage 0.800, and that's where the, there's a really cool suspension bridge here, and, and if you were to continue going up the PCT, you'd go over Pincho Pass and I don't know, about five miles or so. People have tried, you can go west here on this trail and go and use a west exit point on the Sierras, but I, I want to point out this one because unfortunately a couple of years ago, I think it was 2017, there's a big bridge that crosses Woods Creek that got washed out. So just keep that in mind. If you come down to mileage 0.800, and this is all summarized on, on, the, on that uh, snow forge report page on, the, on pctwater.com, that's not an option anymore. Um, most of the time it's going to be exiting to the east. That'll be your faster option. Okay. okay, got another point for you. Go for it. Um, if you want to go out to the west, down to uh, Cedar Grove in Kings Canyon National Park, a road's end down there and on, on, uh, at the bottom of Bubs Creek, um, you can. You don't have to, to leave. You don't have to go by, by Ray Lakes first, get to the suspension bridge, and then turn left. You can go straight down from Forrester all the way down Bubs Creek to the asphalt. That's a very good point. So the, the map I'm showing right now, page four, uh, CA section H from half mile. Um, when you get, when you, this is after you come down Forester and you come down a really long way and it's gotta be tons of snow. Um, at mileage point 787, there's a Cedar Grove trail and that'll take you to Rhodes Inn in Kings Canyon National Park, which I believe is open at this point. But um, there are links to the uh, California Department of Transit on that PCT water snow Ford's report page I told you about and where you can go on the California Department of Transportation, put in the, the number of the highway, make sure it's open. But that that way is still valid. Um, it, it's a loop, basically, is what Ned's referring to. It's, it's, it's a real common uh, backpacking trail called the Ray Lakes Loop. So the first, the first one, the first leg of the loop, yes, will get you out. But if you go over Glen Pass further north here on page five, and then you try to go out via the Woods Creek Way, that bridge has been washed out. And, you know, I'm probably beating this like a dead horse, but the whole point of this is to show you that this information is available to you. You just have to go download it. So I'll show you if we go here. This is the, the page. I know I put a note on here. Where did I put it? Yeah, right here. So mile 799.8 Woods Creek Suspension Bridge. So, you know, I checked the website the other day, the Secchi website, and that bridge is still out. And if... <sighs> I don't know if anyone's ever been on that bridge. I've hiked over it multiple times. It was a big bridge. And the fact that it got washed out, <laughs> it tells you something about the forces of nature that are at work up there. So don't want to mess with that. Okay. Um, getting closer here to, to, to the general Q&A session, just, want, just a few more points. Um, I'm seeing a lot of discussions about flipping. You know, where should I flip to? Is there just going to be more snow? Um, I haven't gotten a lot of updates about Oregon and Washington. I, I just got my first updates on water in Oregon and Southern Oregon last week, although they didn't say anything about snow. I've gotten a few in Northern California around the uh, Hat Creek Rim area and also the Dunsmuir area, Mount Shasta. So I know some people are flipping north up there and there are some sections that are snow free. But if you go, you know, we'll go back to the uh, water report page, click on Northern California look at the pdf and if you go down uh, yeah so i started putting them yeah here like uh, there's here's one for may 8th around mile 1368 um, but the best place is, is to look on the snow report page because i put all the snow there and if we keep on going down there's like a bunch of them here the last one i got was just uh two days ago from daniel from 
mileage point 1501 to 1560 he's telling you you know what he ran into what does he recommend from a, a snow gear strategy so this is all about information in a real-time manner so the more information you can put up there the more you're helping your fellow hikers and what's also nice about having that in reach that that two-way messaging device i mentioned earlier is that you can add the uh the email for the pct water report updates which is water at pctwater.com. You can add that to your inReach, and when you send it, I'll get that instantly. So that's a real-time update that I can put up there, and I update it once a day so people can see it. Whereas if you have to wait for cell phone coverage, then your update can be you know, sometimes up to a week old, which is still valid, but I'd rather know what it was like today as opposed to seven days ago when it comes to crossing a creek or going over a pass. Okay. Um, you know, that, that's that's kind of all the big things I wanted to talk about with you guys. Um, definitely want to open up the floor for, for questions. Um, Ned, I, I, you know, I imagine you want to talk about, you know, the age old dilemmas of micro spikes versus crampons, ice axes versus whippets, <laughs> um, which, you know, we, we did go into some pretty fine detail on the 2017 PCT, PCT Sierra webinar. Um, so. I just open up the floor now to Ned or to people who want to ask questions. I, I don't see any questions in the Skype window, so either I've totally bored you guys to death or, or you don't have any questions. <laughs> so now, now it's now it's your time. You, you tell us what you want, what you want to learn. Yeah, I can just as soon respond to questions, and then one thing leads to another, and that'll cover all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, no one, no one. I mean, if you don't have anything, I can. Oh. I can certainly fill the void if you don't have anything. So. Well, Ryan's typing a message right now. I see it. Let's give him a second to uh, see what he's going to ask. I have a question. Oh, go for it. Um, I'm not able to Skype into you guys, but I, so I have a July 13th departure date from Mammoth, Reds Meadow to Whitney, and using regular hiking boots, heavier boots, but wanted to know if with this melt coming, would I still need micro spikes for that July 13th date? You want to tackle that one, Ned? July. Yeah, um, this sounds really familiar. Have you have we talked about this on Facebook at all? Oh yes, maybe on Facebook. Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. I mean, I, sometimes I think I'm losing it. Um, okay, uh, okay. Let's let's go back to the comment I made about the four four to six week window where the majority of the melt, the thaw, is going to happen. And that time frame, if the thaw is starting now, map out four to six weeks, that's going to put you right on the end of that uh, for July 13th. Uh, what kind of shoes and are uh, most applicable? And you said, uh, would microspikes do? Exactly. I have Solomon. I have two pairs of Solomon boots, a really beefy, heavy, high ankle boot, and then a mid-ankle Solomon boot. Okay. Um, what you're going to have, see, what happens when the, when the Sierra thaws is the snow line will recede up in elevation over time. So the lower elevations will melt out, and um, um, there will still be snow up higher. So most of the time, you're going to be on dry trail. Uh, July, mid-July might have a snow line uh, about mid-July, 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 about eleven five or twelve thousand feet. So if you look at your map, your topo maps, and you see, you know, okay, how steep is that going to be? Uh, you can get a pretty good idea of what kind of footwear you want. Now, also keep in mind that a few other people have gone in before you, either northbound or southbound. At that point. So you're going to be walking on a boot track. So here's the long and short uh, for Matt and for everybody else on the micro spikes versus uh, hiking crampons um, discussion. If you have a boot track to walk in, made by somebody else obviously, the bottom of that boot track is going to be flat side to side. So you, even though you might be on a, a sloped bunch of snow, you're able to stand on a flat surface. So micro spikes are perfectly fine. The issue comes when you step out of the track, like, oh, gee, I want to go over that way. Or why are these people wandering to the left when I can clearly see I want to be over to the right? And so you step out onto a, on a hard snow 
on a steep slope and you uh, you don't have teeth that will bite in because with microspikes, the teeth are more toward the center of the shoe than on the edge. And also when you um, are standing on angled snow, it's the edge of your shoe that's doing all the work and even not the, the uh, hiking crampons. Even their teeth are a little toward the center. So July 13th, what would I do? You could pretty much do anything. I would go with what your your feet are used to, your most comfortable favorite shoe, microspikes will be fine. Poles with snow baskets, because if you don't have the snow baskets, the pole is going to shoot right into the snow. And right when you thought that you could stop yourself, let's say you slipped, you stab your snow into you stab your pole into the snow to catch your balance. Where does the pole go? Sinks into the snow. Where do you go? head first into the snow. So take poles with snow baskets. And because you can always fall on snow, uh, on steep snow uh, at any time, and you never know when, I would take a whippet, but that's me, because most people don't know what a risk looks like. So, And most people don't even want to stop moving. They just want to keep going, and they don't want to drop their pack, take the ice axe off their pack, put the pack back on, figure out what to do with the ice axe, etc. cetera. The whippet's in your hand. Done. A, it's a pole. It's a self-arrest device. It maintains your balance and saves your neck when you tumble down the hill. Yeah, so I'm showing I would a, do that. Showing a photo of it right now on the screen for people who can yeah. see what a whip it's, it looks like. It's really a great device. It was originally designed for um, ski mountaineering, for when the the crazy skiers would would eat it and fall down, and they needed to self-arrest. So uh, it makes the perfect transition to snow hiking, which is becoming more popular. You never know when you're going to fall. You don't know exactly what's up ahead. You know, you're looking at a slope maybe from 100 feet away or whatever going like, man, I can't tell if that's ice or what. You can take out the ice axe. If it's a steep slope, it's in the uphill hand. You sink the shaft all the way into the, into the snow for your uphill anchor. Killer. That's, that's the way you're supposed to go. Um, if you're taking a whippet, it's all about preventing the fall. It's from a less of a climber's point of view and more of a hiker's point of view. So you're using your poles for balance. You're using your micro spikes or your hiking crampons for traction. And should you fall, you've got your whippet right there in your downhill hand because you can't use it as an anchor. It's on your downhill hand and simply self-arrest. All right. Thanks, Ned. Thank you. So I hope that helped. I know we've talked about it before, but... Um, that's what I would do. So, uh, Ryan, no, that's very, that's very good. Thank you. So Ryan, I saw that Ryan, it said that you were typing a message on the Skype window, but it never came up with a message. So I don't know if it just didn't come through or, or what, but I, I don't see a question. Um, I see it's now telling me David L is typing a message. So we'll give that a few seconds to see, see what his question is. And it's saying Ryan is typing. You no, know, so. Matt. <laughs> yeah. Matt, this uh-huh. is really priceless because we can get, you know, people can, can phone in or can go online and join us in this discussion from wherever they are. We may even have people who want to do the John Muir Trail instead of the PCT, and they want to go in early. I get a lot of people asking questions about that. Um, and while we're maybe, I don't know if we're still waiting for uh, uh, someone it, to ask a question. It, but, it came through. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so David L. asked, do snow baskets mean the larger diameter baskets than are standard with most trekking poles? Absolutely. Absolutely. Standard with most trekking poles is a stupid uh, stup- little disc that's maybe a knuckle or two in diameter. So maybe an inch, inch and a quarter in diameter. That is worthless when the snow gets a little bit soft. It's going to go right through. So... Uh, you know, the snow baskets, what are they, three, four inches in diameter instead of an inch and a quarter? Get them. They screw right on. It's it's not a problem. Okay, and, and Ryan said, just wanted to hear the dialogue on ice axe and micro spikes. So, so, yeah, we definitely talked about that and, you know. One. Well, yeah, I guess we did, huh? Okay. Well, unless you had a, other other comments to make on that, Ned. Yeah, one big one, man. Here's the big red flag. Um uh, Equipment does not guarantee safety. So you may have all the bells and whistles that you found online. You figured, man, I'm going to buy all that stuff. I'm going to take it in there. I'm going to be a happy camper. 
if you don't know what you're doing with it, if you don't know what risk looks like and that you're prepared for that risk before you step out on it, like, like stepping out on a diving board, I mean, it's going to flex, it's going to go down. Did you know? You know, and so on snow, you, you can have all the right gear, but it doesn't mean you're going to be safe. So uh, I just really wanted to put that in red letters because, I mean, it goes, it covers all everything, even having a, a lightweight color tent. You know, it can snow on you, and you're going to have a hell of a time with a lot of snow piling up on your tent and condensation and have a miserable night. Or sleeping on snow. You need to have a, a really good pad to sleep on so you get to sleep. Otherwise, you're not going to be sleeping. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's <laughs> a, good, that's a good point, and I'm actually I'm pulling up a, um, a video I, I, you know, I, I look at the the, the blogs and stuff of at, at, at you hikers out there, and this, I'm sure you've heard of Second Chance Hiker. Well, he ran into this guy. I can't remember his name. It's, I think it's John John King, who does a lot of San Jacinto stuff. And and there's this video I'm showing right now, um, where he, he goes through a whole, you know, teaching exercise on how to self arrest, you know, in in for many different ways of falling down down the trail. Now, of course, it's not as good as being right there with, right. Right there with Ned, but <laughs> you know it's it's something that you can watch. No, I can't. Someone, <laughs> uh, someone got a question? Was there a question? Oh, okay. Anyways, um, if you couldn't see that, this will be on the recording that I'll upload to the PCT water site later tonight, so you'll be able to see that. But you know, video is worth a thousand here's, words. So here's another question for you that just came up um, yesterday. I think someone asked. Um, in what hand do you, uh, do you carry a, a whippet? You know, uh, they did, they think it's like an ice axe has to be in the uphill hand, uh, or in the right hand. The person actually said, well, I'm right-handed. Um, I'll probably be able to self-arrest better if it's always in my right hand. And I'm thinking, okay, you're going to cut switchbacks all the way up to Mather Pass, right up the center in the snow. And so if you're going one direction, it's in the, you know, uphill hand and the other direction, it's in the downhill hand. What you've got to do before you even get to Mather, uh, actually, there's a really good slope on the side of Chicken Spring Lake. Uh, there's another one on Trail uh, Trail Peak before you get to Chicken Spring Lake. But somewhere where you find steep snow, drop your pack, get something to eat and drink, get your ice axe or whip it out, and go up and down the slope and practice falling. Um, if you simply don't know anything, Start out by sitting down on the snow with your feet below you, feet pointing toward the downhill, and and glissade, slide on your butt with your feet in front of you. Keep your heels up so that your heels don't hit the snow and, and slow you down. Um, and, and learn how to use your poles as rudders, as brakes, etc. Uh, and then simply roll over. Roll on your stomach and self-arrest. Um, gradually work your way to starting out facing the other direction. In other words, feet uphill, and you go down backwards. What are you going to do? Roll on your stomach, self-arrest. Let's, let's speed and gravity spin you around. Um, and the last thing you want to do is walk across the slope and literally fall down. And once you learn the basics of a self-arrest, at least my students, especially the young ones, the young ones will literally run across the slope and throw themselves like Superman across the slope and crash and burn and tumble and have a great time and then self-arrest and want to do it again. So it can be fun, too. <laughs> the next question that comes up is, well, what happens if I have a pack on? And the pack will, will may or may not, depends how big it is, but your, your pack, usually you can work around it. Just sim simply sit up. And, 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 and then twist to where your, your stomach is on the snow to get around your pack, or you're going to be tumbling anyway. One of the opportunities you have to, to get your chest on the snow and the, and the ice axe under there so you can put all your weight on it and dig it in, that's when you're going to do it. So don't worry so much about the pack because you're going to be tumbling. Okay. Any uh, other questions from the attendees here? I uh, don't see Did anyone typing. Creek crossing? Uh, if you have more comments on it, go for it. Oh, God. Um, okay, first thing, another red letter line. The acronym STOP, if you don't know what it means, it means stop, think, observe, 
plan. When you get to a raging creek and it's like, oh, my God, how am I going to get across this thing? Drop your pack, take a deep breath, you know, evaluate what you see in front of you. In other words, think, observe, and get a plan. And if you can't think of how you're going to do it right there, and I've got tons of stuff I could say about how, that, how you're going to deal, deal with that, go with what Matt was saying earlier. Uh, go upstream because the stream is going to get narrower the further up you go. There's going to be little, little tributaries you can hop across, work your way around, maybe find a great place where there's a lot of rocks or a log going across. That would be upstream. Also consider what happens to a creek when it goes through a meadow. It's going to spread out. It's going to lose a lot of its force. It's going to be shallower. There aren't going to be any rocks at the bottom of the creek crossing for you to trip on. Um, because there's less velocity. So if a meadow is nearby, eh, go check it out. Go see, see how shallow it is. See how fast the water is moving. So meadows work great in going uphill, looking for rock hops and log crossings. First option, always try and find a dry crossing. That's, that, that's a um, great point because the, all, the alternate evolution creek is like that. Exactly. Now that sucker can be deep. Um, so if you're in a group, and there's so much to say. Sorry, guys, if I, if I diverge here a little bit. But if you're in a group and you're looking at something where the smallest person in your group is like five feet tall and that water is, you know, four feet deep or three and a half, you might want to cross in a group. And how to do that is something that you can probably find video things on online. Uh, but essentially, you know, two or three people link arms and you cross as a unit. I'm actually or you, showing. Or you cross as a train. Yeah, I'm actually, you know, up, upstream. I'm showing a video right now um, of the alternate crossing to Evolution Creek that was sent in on June 4th. And it's actually, it doesn't look too bad, but it, but th that's the reason why it's the alternate crossing. So this is, this is a cross, I think it's like a mile before where the PCT actually crosses the um, Evolution Creek. Yeah, I've been through it. Yeah, and w w where it crosses, it, right? I would not want to cross it right now because it, it can be pretty nasty. But this really illustrates what Ned is talking about because it's a wide open meadow. Um, the the creek here is really wide, but there's no rapids, as you can see. I'm just replaying the video over and over again. Um, so it's it's a much easier crossing. Let's uh, see. There are a few more questions here, Ned, that I think you can help. Uh, David L asked, using a whippet, it seems that it would be harder to get it in a rest position, giving the length of the pole, etc. Got any comments on that? You solve that by, you so yeah, you solve that by by um, the expression go to the pick. So whatever, if your if your um, if your whippet is in, I'm just thinking it through here right now. Uh, your left hand, when you fall, what's that hand going to do? The hand is going to is going to uh, the arm is going to bend at the elbow, bringing your your left thumb with the whippet up to your left shoulder. Go to the pick. Which way am I going to roll? I'm going to roll toward my left shoulder. The, the length of the pole doesn't get in the way because it crosses your body as you roll over. So it's like going across your stomach. And so it's not an issue. If it becomes an issue, what I teach my students is if, if you want to go, say, left, and the, and the pole is sticking out that way, simply move the pole in line with your body. Swing it, swing it you know, down by your knees or somewhere so you can roll you know, whatever way you want to go, just get the thing out of the way. You're probably going to be tumbling. So at some point, you're going to look at your, your, your whippet and kind of figure out, okay, where is it? How do I need to do this as you tumble and tumble and tumble? And hopefully you have enough length of tumble to, uh, to do this without hitting a rock or a tree or something. And then collect your thoughts, go to the pick, roll toward the shoulder with the pick, you're done. Okay, uh, there's another question here for you, Ned. Uh, Ryan Stanfield asks, is there any, are there any passes with some fatal glissade potential? <laughs> yeah, all of them. But <laughs> it just, you know, it depends on the route you pick. So you've got to really look, at, like, for example, um, the first one that you're going to have a ball, well, the first ones you need to practice on are those descents that go down into the creeks, like Rock Creek, uh, Crabtree, Crabtree is a good one, uh, Wallace, Wright, etc. Those are steep descents. If you see on your map that there are switchbacks that go that, that the summer trail takes to get down to the creek, if it's snow covered when you're there, 
that's going to be a great glissade run, except there's, there's, there's trees. So you're going to do it in little pieces here and there, 50 feet here, 50 feet there, whatever. Um, good places to practice. Now, once you get up to Forrester and you've made the top, you've had your party, you've had something to eat and drink and all that sort of stuff, and now you've got to beat it because the snow's getting soft and soupy, uh, if you glissade or want to glissade on really soft snow, all you do is your butt hits the snow, you sink in about two feet, and your feet are up above of your chest and you don't go anywhere so um you've got to get up your passes before post tolling hour and that could be as early as nine ten in the morning so um okay now back to your your subject when you go down forester you're following a ridge to the west northwest if you look over the southwest side of that ridge it's a freaking face so you obviously you're not going to go that way now if you look to the northeast there's a lake down there and there's a kind of a beautiful ramp of snow that you can slide down it takes you all the way down to the to the lake so that's a great one but so what i'm getting at here is look at the slope evaluate how steep it is can i do this because if you follow that ridge down from forester all the way to the end, and it's snow-covered, you don't have a trail, you're just picking a route, and you get to the end, it's nothing but, you know, 200 degrees of cliff. So you're going to have to backtrack back up the ridge to those beautiful little ramps all the way down to the lake and then glissade there. And there's about four more beautiful glissades on the way down, but they have nothing to do with the trail. They're a little bit more over to the west. But they get you down to the creek and then follow the creek on down. You're on snow. It doesn't matter where the trail is. It's parallel to the creek. So just follow the creek. Enjoy your glissades. But evaluate those suckers. Yeah, I'm showing a, a photo from actually a photo I took on my 2014 through hike showing exactly what Ned is talking about right here on the looking from the north side of Forester Pass. The main difference here is that 2014 was a real low snow year. So here you can actually see that lake that Ned's referring to and the ridge that the ridge actually goes right along the center of this photo here, if you can see it. Um, so this year, <laughs> a lot of this will be white where you can see rock coming up. But this is yeah. one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar is because if you send in photos from the passes that you go over, then, then post them on the Facebook page, other people can see that and they can you know, use that information to determine, hey, am I in my, over my head or yes, I think I can do that. This is really what it's all about. It's about giving you all the information so you can make a safe decision. Okay. Uh, oh, here okay, we go. I've got another thought for you. Oh, you got uh, a question? Uh, yeah, we got a question here. Uh, I'll, I'll read it to you, then you can finish your thought and maybe answer this one. Uh, uh, David L. says, Clev cleverhiker.com says about river crossings, slower water generally shouldn't be above your thigh, and fast-moving water shouldn't be above your knee. Would you agree or not, and why? Okay. Um, most people have no clue about the amount of push, in quotes, that water can exert on your body you'd have to kind of imagine someone squirting you with a garden hose versus someone hitting you with a fire hose there's a lot of weight to water you know what is a gallon eight pounds so if that eight pounds is hitting you at any kind of velocity um, that's going to push your body so if the creek is steep you see it on the map you know you got a lot of contour lines right there uh, you better expect uh, you know, it's moving pretty fast. It's going to have a lot of push. And if you get to the side of it and STOP, stop, think, observe, plan, and you're evaluating that thing, and you think that it's deeper than your knees, um, knees are pretty skinny. Lower legs are pretty skinny. Um, I don't really have too much of a problem with that. When the water starts getting up to about mid-thigh and it's pushing pretty hard, um, that's when things get a little more iffy. So... It's based on your skill level and risk tolerance and wisdom. But if there's any chance that you might be in over your head, search the bank for a safer crossing. You do not – here's another red-letter sentence. You do not have to cross the creek where the summer trail does. You're on snow. I don't even care if there's no, no snow. You don't have to, if you don't like it, don't cross there. Search the bank. Drop your pack. Take your Snickers. Take your drink with you and hoof it up uphill and find something that's safer. What do you have any um, general thoughts, Ned, about 
at being safer crossing a creek with, with in a group as opposed to going solo? There are advantages and disadvantages to just about everything. Um, I don't care if you're talking about driving on the freeway or talking about crossing a creek. Um, <laughs> Doing a, doing a train maneuver where everybody faces upstream and everybody's sort of hanging on to each other's packs or hips or whatever, uh, your positioning of your strongest and weakest members, tallest and shortest, is fairly crucial. Uh, if the poor person on the back falls off, probably nobody knows it. So you've got to have a real strong person back there. Uh, also in the front, you know, you might not want to have the... Um, uh, weakest person up there either. So you've got to spread out your strong and your weak members, your tall and your short members, and it does help if everybody's coordinated. Now think about this, though. Here you got three or four or five people facing upstream, hanging on to each other's hips, doing what? They're sidestepping. Have you ever sidestepped in a creek where you can't see your feet because it's white water and you're dodging between boulders and uneven surfaces under the water with the side of your foot. That's hard. And also, you hit a rock with the side of your foot, what do you got to do? You've got to go, you got to advance your foot above it and go around the rock or below. And so you're always adjusting your balance. I find it's easier in a group to not face upstream, but to face straight across. What part of your foot is going between the rocks? The skinny part, your toes. Easy to wind your way through the rocks. And with poles put out at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, you want to make a big triangle um, formation of, of balance there, three points of contact. You can pretty much, whether you're in a group or not, you can negotiate um, some of the worst. You know, uh, uh, Matt, what's the name of that creek that's right below uh, Silver Pass on the south side? That one with it's a waterfall right there at the at the at the trail. Yeah, I think it's Silver Silver Pass Creek. Okay, if that's the case, that one is kind of nasty because there's big boulders there. If you're there during the thaw, so the next six weeks, um, you've got a lot of airborne water. You've got a lot of splashing going on, and um, I'm showing a video of. 30, yeah, I'm showing a video that was sent in from June 6th right now. It's on the, the, the oh, Facebook you, page. You are good. What does it look like? It's exactly like you're describing. It's, um, you know, there's water coming down from the right side. Um, this is a northbound hiker. And, yeah, he's having to navigate a bunch of boulders. It's, it's, it's up to, like, his thighs, you know, mid-thighs, almost up to his crotch area. I mean, I, yeah. every, every That's year. That's not good. Yeah, every year I see videos of this particular one, and it, it, it's, it's particularly nasty. <laughs> Yeah, it, it also brings in a whole other subject, which has to do with air current and air temperature. When water's flying through the air, what's it, what's it doing to the air? It's pushing it. So when you get close to a waterfall, hey, I just went into Yosemite Valley, got, off the, got out of the car, got off the bus, walking up Yosemite Falls, what do you feel? You feel cool air, and you feel it moving faster than it was over at the car. So what's going on there at that, that creek crossing um, below Silver Pass, Silver Pass Creek, is that you're going to get wet, probably head to toe because of all the splashing. And because of all the wind movement, because of the water, you're going to become hypothermic fairly quickly. Unless, of course, it's a really nice sunny day and getting wet isn't such a bad idea. Um, and so, oh, God, I just thought of another thing. Um, beware of slippery rocks under the surface. Um, certain creeks, another part of your STOP evaluation is you have to look for uh, slippery kind of mossy kind of suspicious rocks under the water. You might want to cross with your micro spikes on, just food for thought. Uh, also, very early morning crossings, if there was any kind of close to freezing temperatures during the night, because the water level in the creek drops overnight, um, it's going to expose those rocks and logs that were the water was flowing over, you know, earlier in the, in the, you know, yesterday. So those suckers are going to freeze. You put your foot on that rock as you're getting into the creek, and it's going to slip like mad. So wear your, wear your micro spikes if uh, you suspect at all slippery logs, slippery rocks, that kind of thing. So we just got another question here from Scott Forrester. He asked, will the passes ever get snow-free this year? 
Um, and I'm assuming that's the passes on the PCT. And I, I think they will, but it won't be probably till September, right, Ned? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. August hey, Scott, too. glad you made it. Um, I, I've, we've swapped a few messages uh, on Facebook. Um, this year, okay, you know what? It really depends what happens in the thaw. If we get a lot of clouds, rain, rain will accelerate the thaw. Clouds will slow it down. You know, uh, we've we've gotten a two, three foot snowfalls in, in June. You know, in the past, so this sort of stuff can happen. So, um, how long the snow lasts? You know, you could compare to seventeen, where they had snow on the passes in uh, shoot September. So, uh, take your micro spikes, take your take your snow baskets, take your whippet. I if there's a, if I'm going to go on a trip, and I think there's a chance that I might have any kind of steep snow crossing, I'm bringing, I'm bringing a traction device, I'm bringing my whippet, and I'm bringing my snow baskets. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Yeah, just a, a quick comment on that. So in 2017, I, I didn't hike any of the PCT, but I've been section hiking the Sierra High Route. And I, I went over a particular section in 2017. Um, there were uh, three passes that were actually lower than most of the Sierra passes on the PCT. And they were snow-free on the south side, but on the north side, they had snow. And, and that's, yep. a, that's a pretty yep. common thing you're going to see on the PCT. So just be, especially, you know, if you're going northbound, you're looking up this pass and you're going, oh, that doesn't look too bad. More often than not, there's going to be more snow on the other side that you can't see yet. Ah, but major advantage, major advantage to the southbounders. You make your climb in the, on dry surfaces or at least hard snow because it's, it's like 4 in the morning or 5 in the morning and, and you're doing it. When you get to the top, this is your glissade time. So you now can have a hell of a roller coaster ride all the way down and enjoy it, scream and holler and have a ball. If you're southbound, you're slogging through the snow and whatever on the climb up, and it's a bear, and you get to the top, and then it's just banging on down the, the dry trail. So you don't have as much fun, and, and really northbound, you can tell I'm a little biased, uh, is really the way to go. All right. Um, don't see any other questions coming in. doesn't look like anyone's typing. Um, I have another question. Go for it. Hi. Um, so I have a list of creek crossings for the JMT going south, and I just wanted to read them off and wanted to know if I had to add any. So uh, Silver Creek, Mott, Mott Creek, Bear Creek, Evolution Creek, Palisade, South Fork of the Kings, White Fork, Tyndall, uh, Wright Creek and Wallace. So I, there's probably a few more in there. What I recommend you do is you go to the PCT okay. water report page because I have all these creeks okay. listed on there. Okay. So, yeah. So, so go to PCTwater.com, click on the Sierra snow and Ford report. And I'm showing it right now. If you, if you, if you can see it, um, oops, if I can find it, where'd it go? Here it is. Snow report. And so not, th this page is dual dual purpose. Not only is it talking about the passes and conditions and updates I've gotten, but it also has information on the creek crossings. Um, but now th this is all PCT northbound mileage points, so your mileage points aren't going to match up with, with um, JMT southbound. Um, but for the most part, the JMT is the PCT, except for the very beginning, starting in Yosemite. Um, and you, you'll join the PCT at Tuolumne Meadows, and then it's it's this, it's the same trail except for a small section close to Mammoth, where the official JMT, which is actually nicer than the PCT, um, goes west. And then of course at the end when it deviates to go up to Mount Whitney. But all of the all the major creeks that you're going to need to know about are on that page. Hmm. Thanks. Sure. What? Let me ask. Let me ask a question. What's your name? Uh, my name is Lynn Thanks. Collins. Okay, Lynn. Oh, yeah, I've seen your name. Okay, yeah. Lynn. And you're leaving July 13th, right? Right. Okay. And, and also, um, here's the thing. Huh? Uh, just one quick comment. Um, on, on the Facebook page, which I'm showing right now, uh, California Section H, there, there was a gentleman who posted yesterday a whole list of creeks here. And um, if you can't say it, you'll be able to see on the recording. But this was from a hiker in 2017. She she put together you know all the major creeks um, and you know little hints on where she found logs and stuff like that. Um, so it's a great resource. Perfect. Just caveat, you know, it's two years old. 
And so if she says, hey, I crossed a log here, that log may not be there anymore. <laughs> but, um, but, but it kind of goes back to your question about a list of the creeks. So I think between those two, you should be able to get a pretty concise list. Go ahead, Ned. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, the only thing I was going to add just for Lynn and for everybody else, uh, when you look at your maps and you're kind of like going, okay, is this creek going to be good, you know, easy or, or bad, nasty, dangerous? A lot of that has to do with, obviously, the slope of the hill, but also how long the creek is. The longer the creek, the more tributaries it has, the more water volume it's going to have, the more snow melt is dumping into it. So uh, you can kind of anticipate, just by looking at your map, um, where the sketchy ones are going to be. So um, that's how it works. I'd rather, I'd rather teach you how to fish than give you a fish. So that's, that's the kind of... Um, uh, way I look at them. Yeah, Bear Creek, I think, is a good example of that. I'm, I'm showing the half mile map, uh, page 20 on section H right now. Um, so you can see WA, I think it's 869. Yeah, that, that's where it crosses. And there's all these little tributaries and creeks all coming down into one area. And that's why Bear Creek is notoriously one of the more dangerous, dangerous crossings. So yeah, by looking at the maps, like Ned has mentioned, you can kind of you can kind of foresee if it's going to be a, a pain in the butt. You can also see all the tributaries, mm -hmm. and if the if the main channel uh, below the tributaries is nasty, simply go up and deal with the, the skinnier tributaries. And it's yeah, you're gonna cross you know ten or what five or whatever, but instead of one, but it's not gonna be um, life threatening. Yeah. So on this Bear Creek map, which I'm presenting right now, I there, there's actually an alternate map on the uh, the Facebook site under CA Section H, but um. I've had a lot of hikers send me in updates in the past year, especially in 2017, where WA0869, that's where it, the PCT officially crosses Bear Creek, but that's probably one of the worst spots to cross because it's pretty much yeah. one, one big river at that point. Um, a lot of hikers hiked up like a mile, and then they crossed, you know, if you can see my my, my uh, cursor moving across, you could see all these numerous tributaries. I count one, two, three, four, you know, five, six tributaries. They crossed up there, higher, above where the PCT crosses, and that yeah. was a lot safer for them. Of course, it's a pain in the ass because you're, you know, you're hiking back upstream, and you know it takes more time. But I'd rather take more time as opposed to drowning in a creek. So yeah, yeah it's one of the things you got to deal with at this time of year. You yeah. know, it's part of the experience. You know, if you want, uh, you know, a walk in the park, you're going to have to go August, you know, September maybe. You know, maybe only after normal winters or drought winters, you know, for a dry trail experience and easy creek crossings. But if you want to do, you know, add a little more zip to, to your challenge and, and, and deal with some uh, a little bit of snow, a little more snow than you're used to, maybe a little bit deeper creeks and stuff, um, that's part of the, the, the strength that you're going to be building um, and the confidence you're going to get as you deal with these things with wisdom. Okay, so David L. asks, can you show again how you got to the list of 2017 crossing conditions on the Facebook group? Um, okay, so, well, two answers to that. So the, the first one I showed was actually from the PCT Water website. So I'm showing it here, and you go down, and you click on Sierra Snow and Ford Report, and then that should pop up a PDF. And from here, you can get the verbal description of all the updates. So that, that, that's one step. And then if you go to the PCTA, I'm sorry, uh, the PCT Water Fire Passes Fords update group, which I manage. Um, and by the way, I, I'm kind of a Facebook novice, so I haven't figured out. <laughs> you you ha it has to send me a message to say, do you approve this member? I approve everyone, so and I try to do it very quickly, so don't worry about that. But once you get on this page, if you click on down here on the left side, you'll see a, a column for photos. And then you click on albums to the right of that. So it pulls up. The way I've categorized it is by the actual sections, you know, so California section H is the big Sierra section. Once you click on that, it'll take you to all the photos and videos that have been uploaded to me. And it's sorted by the mileage point from a North Bounder perspective. So the very first one here is uh, mile 778 right on the south side of Forrester Pass. So, okay, if that didn't answer your question, David, let me know. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, David said it did. Okay, no problem. So we're, we're throwing a lot of information at you guys. That's why I wanted to record this, and you'll be able to watch this later. But um, 
I don't see anyone typing a message and I don't hear anyone asking a question. So I'm going to assume there's no more questions. Um, if that's a wrong assumption, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should, kind of running through I my probably head. should word what, that differently. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rehearsing yeah. in my head what they need to know, even if they don't know to ask for it. Um, <laughs> well, Scott, okay, Scott says thank you. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to consider here, and kind of going back to what the, the point I made earlier, this is really your decision. There are social media just drives me nuts sometimes because no matter what position you take, there's always going to be people saying wrong decision. You're making the wrong decision. You're stupid. <laughs> um, there is no right decision. The only right decision is the right decision for you. There are people going through right now. I'm getting updates daily and they're making it. And yeah, it's a challenge, but you know, a lot of these people, they, they already have some previous snow experience or they're going in with, as a group. A lot of these photos and videos that I've shown you today are taken by someone else because you see the video I showed earlier of a guy crossing the creek. Obviously, he didn't take it. There was someone there take it, taking video of it. Um, you know, and if, if if you don't feel like this is your cup of tea and you want to wait, that's a perfectly fine decision, and that's a very safe decision that you made on your own. So it's a very personal decision, and I'll I'll stop beating that dead horse. I just I, I get a little bit out of shape because I when you get on Facebook and someone asks a question, there's always people who are attacking them for that decision or that question. So just, you know, to me, it's all about having access to all the information, taking that information, digesting it and going, OK, what do, do I want to proceed forth? And if so, how am I going to do this? And if not, that's great, too. OK, kind of uh, related uh, to that. I wanted to let me let me just add a couple of things here. Sure. Uh, related to, uh, to that is if you've got a question about, you know, some sort of extreme condition or whatever on the trail and you, you, you say, think, OK, I'm going to ask somebody from last year. Well, the person from last year. Yeah, maybe he went through the year and all that great stuff. He dealt with the snow and the creeks. and That's great. But he had one experience with it. Yeah, it was four weeks long and he got a lot of experience. But what you want to do, if you've got a question about something, you don't want to talk to somebody who, you know, oh, man, I went through it with, with shorts and, and trail runners and didn't have a problem, and anybody who's, you know, whining about it, those aren't the guys you want to talk to. You want to talk to somebody who, who lives in it, someone who, who works in snow for their job. You want to talk to somebody who does a lot of uh, uh, – spends a lot of time on trail teaching snow skills. Or go to talk to a, a ski area, the ski patrol guys. They, simp they work in the snow all the winter long, not just on skis. They're, they're in their boots shoveling and doing stuff. They know how to edge. They know how to, you know, maintain their balance on a steep slope. So talk to people who have spent years doing it if you can. And through Facebook and social media, all you got to do is throw up the question and say, listen, I want to find somebody who does, who's been doing this for years. You know, triple crowner maybe, somebody who's been up in Alaska, I don't know. You know, that's what I'm getting at. And so kind of not to blow my own horn, but I've been doing this for 37 years. You know, we'll spend two to four months on the snow every year of the 37 years. So I've seen drought winters. I've seen crazy deep winters. I've seen all kinds of stuff, winters that are extended, winters that don't start till January or February. There's all kinds of stuff. But um, that's just a recommendation. Talk to the people who live in it. And there was another thing, but I forgot. But anyway, oh, uh, <laughs> we could get into more details on, on the creek crossings, what to put on your feet, how to maintain your balance, other than just the evaluation, which is about all we've talked about, except for I kind of took off on the train versus the solo crossing and the which way you face and stuff. But um, only if you want. I don't know what Matt's schedule is here, but, but I'm at your disposal if you want to. Uh, get some questions answered to fulfill your dream. This is a dream opportunity for you guys. And don't go into it afraid. Ask questions. And remember, your gear isn't what's going to save your life. It'll help. It's a tool. Just a tool. Snowshoes are just a tool. They turn into skis on steep slopes. So beware. But yeah, so you got to know what to do with things. Yeah, so I think if you know if anyone else has questions for right now, you know, type it into the Skype message boss or ask you know verbally. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, Ned is very active on Facebook. I'm very active on Facebook. 
Um, I like to think yeah. I'm pretty responsive. I know Ned is extremely responsive. Um, he, you know, so ask him questions, ask me questions, and, and maybe just one final point if there's no more questions, because um, I'm, I'm seeing this happen a lot. Um, when you send me an updates, please, please, please send the mileage point and the date that you were there. Um, I, I, I get a lot of updates where it says, hey, um, you know, I, all creek crossings between this mileage point and this mileage point are fine, or something like that, just as an example. And that doesn't really help me or the people viewing the information. I need to know the exact mileage point or, or the waypoint, like the half mile uh, waypoint on the, on the maps also works great. And also, you know, um, what date you were there. And more importantly, especially for the passes and the creeks, what time of the day you were on the pass or going through the creek. I'll yeah. put that information up there because that makes a big difference for both of those topics. So, okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> um, any other questions for, for Ned or myself? I think uh, you know there was something you alluded to, Matt, um, that we didn't really answer. You, you talked about the conundrum of crossing the creek in the morning yeah. for the safe creek crossing yeah. versus what that's going to do to your pass crossing mm -hmm. midday. Yeah, that's a Did great. Do you want to hit that or or let it go? No, I, I think it's worth bringing up. I thought about it too, so um, I'll I'll let you run with that one. Um. Okay, so here are the things that you guys got to think about. When it comes to your daily logistics, what do I do each day uh, in what order? Yes, uh, creek crossings will have less volume of water in the morning uh, because, you know, less heat during the night, less snow melting, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really you're going like, man, i got to camp next to the creek. And then I'll cross the creek in the morning. But if the path, like, say, Tyndall, you know, the pass is four and a half miles from Forrester, and you're going a mile an hour on snow, which is what you're going to do. That's going to put you four and a half hours from your creek crossing. Uh, the sun's probably up. It's probably turning to soup, the snow is. And then you're not going to have a really great glissade, or you're going to have even post holing all the way, you know, that last mile just to get to Forrester. And that is absolutely miserable. So it, there's a, it's a toss-up. If you want to hit the pass, um, ideally, it's almost the same time as when you cross the creek. I hate to say it, <laughs> but you're going to need to. That's why it's uh, a conundrum. <laughs> and you certainly don't want to cross the creek in the, in the end of the afternoon. The end of the afternoon, cr creek crossings are can be notorious, and that's probably when those girls got killed a couple years ago. Um, so don't do that. That's pretty much sound advice. But camp next to the creek, get across the creek really early in the morning, headlamp, 4 o'clock, whatever, in the morning, and then make tracks on dry trail as fast as you can to get up there, hit snow line, then it's, you know, however many miles on snow up to the pass before uh, the sun starts hitting uh, the snow around the pass and, and melting it real quick because it's not freezing overnight anymore. You, don't, you may not have hard snow to walk on once the thaw starts, and the thaw is starting now. So, um, the sooner you guys get through the Sierra, the better. Take a look at the length of those creeks. Here's another warning. The washboard on the northern side of uh, Yosemite National Park, Matterhorn Creek and um, uh, Tilden and, and I can't remember the names. After Tuolumne Meadows, you know, you've got to go towards Sonora Pass. All of those are long creeks, meaning a lot of water, deep, fast, nasty. So you're going to cross those in the morning. Yeah, and to that point, um where the second fatality happened was actually in Yosemite at Rancheria Carrot Creek, mile 981, which is, you know, 170 miles north of the South Fork of the Kings River, where the first fatality happened. Um, so just because you, you get to Yosemite doesn't mean you're out of the woods, so to speak, when it comes to creek crossings. And they happen later in is the hiking year, creek? too. What's that? That's a long creek, isn't it? Oh, isn't yeah. Isn't that right near Tilden? Uh, it, it's yeah. clo cl somewhat close to Tilden, but it's a very long creek. Um, this, th that section of the, of the PCT in Yosemite is actually very challenging because you're just, you're, you're, you're hopping across canyons. So you're going up and down, up and down, up and down. And every time you go down, Washboard. yeah, there's this big ass Creek you got to cross. And, and what a lot of people don't realize, both of these fatalities in 2017 happened later in, in the year. Um, I'm going off the memory here, but I believe one was in late June and the other one was early July. You know, whereas a lot of people think that it was like, you know, late May, early June, it wasn't. So it was, you know, and I don't know, Ned, if you'd still consider that part of the thaw for that year, 
but it's it's not you're not going to be safe just because you're in this section say you know july time frame is my point because of the high yeah, it rates. all has to do with how much snow is melting uh 17 versus 19 you gonna you got a lot of snow to consider i would say still again four to six weeks from the beginning of the thaw middle of july is it could have depending upon cloud cover rain issues additional snow perhaps um it could have a lot of snow still melting in the middle of July. If that's the case, STOP, evaluate each thing, you know, make, your, make up your mind. Hey, do I have it together to, to do this uh, this late in the afternoon? No, okay, I'm going to camp here. I'm going to cross in the morning. I don't care if my, I'm behind my group. Don't get this thing where you've got to be with your group. Let people know that, you know, hey, I'm going to come along at my own speed. If you don't see me at night, doesn't mean I've, I've, I've died somewhere. I've just decided that I'm going, to, I'm going to camp somewhere and cross in the morning, and that's great. You'll catch up with them later. Probably what happened with some of these people, at least some of those that I've rescued in search and rescue, they think they have to stay in their group, and they've fallen behind, and now they're running and they're, being, they're hasty. Not literally running, but now they're pushing. And they're not making wise decisions to try and catch up with their group, and that's a big mistake. So going back to, to your initial point, Ned, about the, the, the dilemma that, that these hikers all face, you know, in terms of timing, getting up and over the pass, you know, after it's not icy, but before you start post tolling and then getting, you know, across that, that raging river at the bottom of the valley before you approach the ne next pass, <laughs> what would be the 10,000 foot overview in your opinion and how to strategize that? Like, like camp as close as possible to that pass the day before, but then, I mean, do you have any guidelines in terms of, well, if I go up too early, then yeah. it's going to be really icy, right? Okay. What I'm saying, if you guys can't quite picture this is uh, we can even take uh well, heck you could take crossing Pincho and then you've got South Fork of the Kings and then you've got Matter. So if you, um uh that's kind of a that's kind of a kind of different like one though because that, that they're so close together but but I, I understand your point yeah no that's probably not the best one but the point that the rule of thumb is um if you get to a creek late in the afternoon and it's over you know it's you can't handle it then camp there and what that is going to mean is you're still perhaps you know descending maybe then you're going to turn and come up like going over kearsarge uh whatever there's going to be hours of time before you hit snow line and then you're going to have to book it in the snow which at that point in the morning the snow may be soft it's going to be really you know difficult you're going to be floundering and and, and it's going to be post holding is not fun guys so if you haven't done it um, it can be really jarring and you can get hurt doing it so i i, I can um, attest to that because i i fractured i had a stress fracture in my right foot in 2014 post holding coming down four star i hit a rock and I literally limped for the next 1,500 miles. I had to wrap my foot in athletic tape. Jeez. I never said I was Jeez. smart, but <laughs> but yeah, that's where post only not only is it time consuming and, and, and it takes a lot out of you physically, but you can injure yourself. And I'm a personal testament to that. Sorry, go ahead, Ned. Yeah. I don't know if I covered your question. No, you did. Because I mean, it is a conundrum. Yeah, it's there is basically no easy answer to it. And this is why, you know, it's really important when you're at, you know, you're in your tent at night, you look at your maps and you're kind of strategizing in your head. OK, what's the next day going to look like? And I, to me, the way I approach this is I'm going to try and camp as close as possible to the next pass. Um, yeah, but, that's, it. that's it, really. Yeah. But but as Ned said, you know, may, maybe you come across a creek and it's late in the day and you're like, I don't feel comfortable crossing this creek, even though I want to get close to that pass. Well, then, you know, walk upstream. Maybe there's a safer crossing. If not, then camp your ass down for the night because it'll be easier and safer to cross that creek the next day. So, I mean, these are decisions you're making on the fly. And, and, and it's an ever-changing, you know, every day it changes. And that's why it's so important that, that you guys send me in, you know, send updates. send, send Videos are the best. They're the best right? Especially of other people trying to cross the creek or, or passes because I can post that on the Facebook page and, and video is worth a thousand words. But, you know, and, and the faster you can do that, the, the better it will be for the hikers behind you. But until it becomes your reality, until you cross your first creek, you don't really know, like Matt says, it, it, it's a, it changes every day. The currents are going this way, the snow is going that way, it's whatever. After you, you will learn what to look for. You will get better and safer at it. 
So don't freak out and go like, oh, my God, these guys talked about all this scary stuff, and I screw that. I'm going to go to Northern California. But um, there's nothing more beautiful. Oh, my God, the Sierra under snow is gorgeous. And when it's all melting, it's like you're in Rivendell because there's waterfalls everywhere cascading on, on all the walls of all the canyons. It's absolutely amazing. It'll be a story you'll tell the rest of your life, you know, but you'll get better at evaluating the hazards. So um, don't be freaked out by all this stuff we're saying, but glean little bits of things that you remember to look for as far as identifying the risk, you know, before you put yourself in the creek, before you step out across Forester's Chute, you know, before you decide, hey, I'm going to press on. I, in, my, in my search and rescue call-outs, I talk to my victims, and, and I say, oh, can, you know, what were you doing in a time that you got hurt? And, it, and most of them will tell you. They were in a hurry to get back to the car. They were, they were making, you know, unwise decisions. Uh, there was a snowball effect because of, oh, I forgot a certain tool, and then because that, then I got wet, and then the wind came up and the clouds, and I got hypothermic. So everything snowballs. Stuff like that, it, you'll get better. So don't don't freak out. All right. Um, well, I don't I don't see any other questions going in, so I think we're gonna we're gonna close this out. Uh, if anyone has a question, feel free to chime in now. But um, I'll try to get this uh, recording up on the PCT Water YouTube page tonight, and with the slides, the PowerPoint slides with the hyperlinks in them, so you can download those and just click on them. Um, we'll be on the PCTWater.com website. Um, probably tomorrow and uh, yeah just you know remember to send in your updates to me um, photos videos text you know I'll, I'll take any of the three although video is the best and uh, you know more importantly have a safe and, uh, and a great hike out there it's the time of time of your lives it's it's a great experience Indeed. all right I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close out this this uh, webinar thanks for everyone attending and uh, happy hiking take care thanks again Matt thank you